Feedback is a term used in climate change science to refer to those factors that can speed up or slow down the pace of change. Four elements are key to understanding these effects. Clouds, rain, trees, and ice. With us to explain, Kate Marvel, Associate Research Scientist at Columbia University and at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, and we are delighted to welcome you to the province of Ontario. It's so nice for you to make some time for us. Thank you so much for having me. You are a climate scientist who uses computer simulations to figure out how climate change is going to happen. How do that, and we hear a lot about this obviously and it's very controversial, so tell us how these things actually work. So when I talk about climate models, the thing that I want to make really clear is that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. We are never going to have a computer simulation that is able to capture all of the nuances of reality. And if we did have one, that would be like the matrix, right? That, would, that might be pretty creepy. Um, and so what we want is to make sure that the models that we're using to project future conditions are reliable, are telling us something useful, and are revealing things that we understand about the physics and chemistry of the climate system. And in your view, how reliable are what we have right now? I think they're very fit for purpose. I think we don't know everything, but we don't know nothing. Hmm. How far into the future can these climate modelings take us? With accuracy. With accuracy. Well, we routinely project to the end of this century, so the year 2100. Mm. And these are projections, they're not predictions. We're not saying these are things that are definitely going to happen. And that's because there is a lot of uncertainty. There's uncertainty about what people are going to do. Yeah, we could change our behavior exactly. and that would change the modeling. And I'm a physicist. That's not my job, to track people. Mm. Um, but there's also some uncertainty in the physical system. There's uncertainty about how the actual climate will react to lots of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Can you also, well, I guess you can. You can look backwards as well. Like the, the, the trees and the rings and all that business. Can you tell me about that? Exactly. So we can run the models forward in time, and we can also run them backward in time. Mm. So we recently had a study that came out that was saying climate models are saying in the early half of the 20, 20th century, you should see a faint but noticeable imprint of human influence on global drought conditions. Mm. And it turns out that if you look at tree rings, if you look at thousands of different tree rings, which give you a picture of drought conditions at the beginning of last century, those say the same thing. And so that was amazing because that kind of enhanced our confidence in the models, which we're saying, you should see this. And then what the models are saying you should see is reflected in the trees. And what, in fact, did they say? They said we should see a, a fingerprint of human influence. So drying in the American Southwest, drying in the Mediterranean, a little bit of drying in Australia. And that coherent picture of change is indeed what was happening. We're going to go through a bunch of terms because if I've got somebody as smart as you here, it would be silly not to take advantage of your expertise to better understand all of the different forces that are bringing climate change upon us. So let's, let's go through some of these. Forcings. What are forcings? So the climate is determined by the balance of energy. We get most of our energy from the sun, 99.99% of all energy. Um, and then the Earth takes that sun energy, heats up, and sends it back into space as thermal or infrared radiation. Hmm. Um, and anything that upsets that balance of energy in and energy out is what we call a forcing. So uh, there can be natural forcings, like changes in the sun's output, or changes in the Earth's orbit, or volcanic eruptions that put a bunch of gas and dust in the atmosphere and block the sunlight. But we know that humans can also force change. So carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases, increasing those in the atmosphere increases the heat that gets trapped from the planet. And so that is a forcing as well, because that is upsetting that balance, that very delicate balance of energy in and that, energy out. That's what I was going to ask you. How delicate is the balance? How delicate is the balance? I don't know if I have a scientific uh, qualification of, of how delicate it is. But when we, we get 340 watts from the sun per every meter squared, square meter of, of the planet. Um, and if we doubled carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from pre-industrial concentrations, that would be about 3.7 watts per square meter. So we're talking about a tiny fraction of the energy that we get from the sun, but it turns out that that has really, really severe consequences. So it is a very delicate balance. It is a very delicate balance. We can mess balance. it up without too much effort, actually. Exactly. Huh. Okay, next one, another term that we hear, feedbacks. 
This is not feedback like from mm -hmm. the speaker system when you've got two of them too close together. How do they figure in your world? The way I like to think about this is in terms of the difference between global warming and climate change, which people use interchangeably because they're related. But they shouldn't. So you change temperature, mm -hmm. and that leads to changes in aspects of the climate rainfall patterns, cloud cover, where the ice is, and those changes can themselves change the temperature. They can feed back onto the temperature. So that's why we call them feedbacks. Okay, should we go through them? Clouds, how do they change the feedback? Clouds are one of the least well understood aspects of the climate system. And that's because clouds play this dual role in the climate system. They both trap, or they both block sunlight which means they have a cooling effect, mm -hmm. but they also trap heat coming up from the planet. So clouds themselves have a greenhouse effect. So clouds both warm and cool the planet, and we know there are different kinds of clouds, those high, thin, wispy clouds, those low, thick clouds. Um, they live all over the planet, and it turns out that they are actually very hard to simulate in a climate model. Mm -hmm. And that's because clouds are simultaneously really small. You get clouds when you put um, a a, a dust grain in the atmosphere, and tiny uh, droplets of water coagulate around that dust grain. So that's happening at a really small scale. Um, but then at the same time, clouds cover a really large fraction of the entire surface of the planet. Mm -hmm. So in order to get clouds perfectly right, you need a climate model capable of tracking every dust grain and every water droplet in the entire atmosphere. That sounds complicated. We don't have computers that mm. are powerful enough to do that. So you've not been able yet to determine whether or not clouds are actually providing more benefit as opposed to more harm as it relates to climate change. So clouds are the big wild card. Um, if you look at every different climate model used right now, every single one of them projects warming in response to increased carbon dioxide emissions. But the degree of their warming is completely different. Some say we could be expecting two or three degrees Celsius by the end of the century, and some are saying five or six degrees. Hmm. Um, and to put that into context for you, four and a half degrees is the difference between now and the last ice age. So we are talking about the difference between very bad and catastrophe here. And it turns out that the reason models disagree on how hot it's gonna get in the future is because models disagree on what clouds are gonna do. But in no model do clouds reverse that warming trend. Hmm. In no model do clouds kind of save us from global warming. So either way, regardless of who's right, it behooves us to do something about this. I agree. Okay, uh, second climate feedback, precipitation. What impact does that have? So precipitation is water that comes from the atmosphere. And we know that warmer air holds more water vapor. So for example, um, well, we know due to the laws of physics that you increase the temperature of the atmosphere by one degree Celsius, you can hold 7% more water vapor. And what that means is that that is more water vapor that lives in the atmosphere that can be dumped on us in the form of extreme rainfall. And so that's why we expect to see downpours getting heavier in the future. Now, the important part of that for a, from a feedback perspective is that water vapor itself is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So if we put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that warms up the atmosphere, then it holds more water vapor, the water vapor traps more heat, and then that feeds back onto the temperature. So that's an example of something, and I'm really sorry for this terminology, that we call a positive feedback. Because when normal people hear positive feedback, they think, you know, I'm doing a great job. Good. And when scientists say positive feedback, we mean destabilizing process that could make global warming much worse. Hmm. So I'm really sorry for that terminology. But this is a case where positive is actually very negative. Exactly. Okay, third climate feedback, forest cover the impact it has. So one of the big wild cards moving forward in the next generation of more sophisticated climate models is the carbon cycle. What's going to happen to carbon in the future? Are we going to get more trees that are absorbing more of that carbon dioxide, more phytoplankton? Or um, are we going to see major decreases in the health of forests due to pests, uh, forest fires, a whole bunch of different things. So this is this is a really big uncertainty, and this is a really big wild card. Hmm. Last one, ice and reflection. So this, for me, I think, is the most intuitive feedback, because we know what ice does when it gets warm, right? It melts. melts. And ice is very reflective. It's very shiny. And so right now, those polar ice caps are doing a really good job of turning back sunlight that would otherwise get to the planet. So they're having a cooling effect, just like those reflectors you put on your car's windscreen on a hot day. Hmm. And if you increase the temperature of the planet, 
and you melt that ice, you're getting rid of that reflective screen because that reveals darker um, ground or ocean below. And so that is another example of a positive or destabilizing feedback where it gets hot, you melt the ice, you lose that reflective shield and that makes it even hotter. Can you estimate for us what percentage of scientists believe what you just laid out? Um, what percentage of climate scientists or yes. overall scientists? Um, as you like. I mean, I'm not a sociologist, um, but I have read a couple papers in literature that indicate that anywhere between 95 and 98% of scientists accept the consensus that climate change is real, it's here, and it's caused by humans. So if someone were trying to advance an argument and essentially poke holes in all of what you just said, how should we regard that? Um, if they are doing it in the scientific literature, I would be thrilled because I love to learn new things. Um, and arguing that carbon dioxide, which we've known is a greenhouse gas since the 1800s, arguing that carbon dioxide has no effect, that requires a revolution in our understanding of physics. And so if you can make that argument, that would be very exciting. But I haven't seen anybody make that argument convincingly yet. And if people were to say, the planet naturally warms and cools as it has since time immemorial. Therefore, we don't need to get as excited about this as the 95% of the scientists you just quoted say we ought to. Our response should be what? I feel like that argument is like telling a detective on the hunt for a serial killer that, oh, people die of natural causes. We know that people die of natural causes, but that doesn't mean that murder doesn't exist. We know that the climate has changed before. In fact, climate scientists have done most of the work to show that the climate has changed before. But that doesn't mean that humans are not causing climate change right now. Cloud seeding, that's another term. What is that? So cloud seeding refers to what we call weather modification. And that was famously used before the Beijing Olympics to ensure good weather um, during the games. Um, so we've had this technology for a number of years. Um, a lot of times, um, because I'm a climate scientist, so that's long-term trends and not a weather scientist, which is short-term uh, variability, um, a lot of times that comes up in the context of what we refer to as geoengineering, mm -hmm. so deliberate modification of the climate. So I mentioned that clouds have this effect of, of blocking sunlight. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is if we could make more clouds that would block sunlight, then that would slow down the warming and maybe buy us a little bit more time to act on climate change. Now, that has major, major side effects. Um, you can cool down the planet, probably, if you block a lot of sunlight. But a lot of things like sunlight, like plants. Um, and that also doesn't do anything about things like ocean acidification. Mm. And more, I think, frighteningly, we still have those uncertainties and we can't tell exactly what is going to happen because the climate system is a really, really complex beast. And so I think, again, there are no silver bullets to climate change. And I would be really, really wary of anybody proposing that as a sort of magic solution. How do you actually do it? Um, so we are actually doing natural experiments, or um, inadvertent experiments, I mm -hmm. guess, not natural experiments right now. Um, from space, you can actually see the ship tracks as uh, major ocean liners cross the Pacific, for example. Um, and that's because the ships going across the Atlantic are emitting pollution, and that is seeding clouds in their wake. So you can see these trails of clouds um, in the wake of ships. Um, so the idea, I think, would be to do that on a larger scale and to do that with more deliber deliberation as opposed to the inadvertent way that we do it right now. Sounds like it would cost billions upon billions to do. It would probably be cheaper than dealing with the impacts of climate change. Okay, fair enough. Uh, okay, we have covered forcings. We have covered feedbacks. Let's do one more of these expressions that you folks deal with. Climate tipping points. What are they? So climate tipping points refer to things um, which I would call unknown unknowns. So clouds... You sound like Donald Rumsfeld I'm right so now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the, I'm very insulted. <laughs> no, don't be. <laughs> um, so feedbacks are things that we understand fairly well. So for example, we ice, ice feedback, melting the ice, that's a, that's a known known. We know that that will happen if we make the planet warmer. Clouds are an example of a known unknown. Um, we know that we don't understand enough about clouds, and that's why we're putting a lot of research into understanding how they'll change in the future. 
something like a tipping point could be something that we don't know that we don't know. Um, so something like an unexpected release of methane from, from melting permafrost that we failed to anticipate, that we haven't um, included in our climate models. Um, so how to think about things that we haven't thought about is a really active area of both science and statistics and honestly philosophy. So we're starting to think about how could we anticipate things that we haven't anticipated. Sounds like this category in some ways is the scariest of all. If oh, it's you are terrifying. It, it, terrifying. Okay, that's a better <laughs> word. Well, let's go through a few climate tipping points right here. Uh, okay, ocean circulation. What's that? Um, so have you seen the movie Day After Tomorrow? Uh, who hasn't? Yes, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> yes. So I, I want to be very clear that I am not endorsing any of the science in that movie. Um, but that is a fictional example of a tipping point where um, melting ice sheets inject a lot of um, fresh cold water. And that changes the circulation of water in the Atlantic, the thermal hailing circulation. And that leads to a rapid cooling, um, which in the movie is takes place over a couple of days. Um, in the real world, um, uh, as the Earth was coming out of the last ice age, we think that there was a period of time called the Younger Dryas, where all of a sudden it got much cooler. And all of a sudden here is in geological terms, not Hollywood terms. Mm. Um, but there is some evidence for disturbances to the thermal hailing circulation, disturbances to the overturning of, of water in the Atlantic, leading to relatively abrupt climate changes. Now, in the short term, and short term being our lifetime, we may not have to worry about that, but there are other things that we know about. There are known knowns that I think are, are much more pressing and that we do have to worry about. If we find ourselves in those kinds of circumstances, do you recommend, as the movie does, that we hide in a library and burn all the books to stay warm? Sounds great. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, climate tipping points. Second one, ice loss. What can you tell us about that? So we are in a very peculiar situation right now where we are releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere a hundred times faster than we know of in the last 800,000 years of the Earth's history. So the climate changes that we're seeing are unprecedentedly rapid. And that is a real challenge for science because the ice sheets have never melted this quickly before. It's never gotten warm this quickly before. And so there's a lot of uncertainty about what happens when you do this. Um, and so a lot of um, research is going into, well, how do ice sheets melt? And there are some scary things that are coming out of that. Hmm. Uh, let's, you did refer to this a second ago, but I'm going to follow up on it here. The rapid release of methane. Mm -hmm. How might that happen and what would the impact be? So there is a known known when it comes to methane. And the known known is that methane is an incredibly powerful and potent greenhouse gas. It's about 25 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. It doesn't live as long as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but that hardly matters if it's being continuously injected into the atmosphere. Um, we know that there is a lot of methane locked up in the permafrost in northern Canada, the Arctic, um, and as that melts, we expect to see the methane being released into the atmosphere. And that is another example of a positive, or I prefer destabilizing feedback, yes. where you put, you melt the permafrost, that puts more potent greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and that in turn feeds back and makes it warmer. So we expect that that will happen. Um, there's sometimes been some media attention around a methane bomb, so um, a rapid release of methane from either the ocean or the permafrost. And there's not a lot of evidence to support a methane bomb, a sudden and rapid release of methane, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest the sort of slow and steady inexorable feedback. Hmm. Let's finish up on this. You, you testified a couple of weeks ago to Congress, did you not? I did. Um, how hard is it to persuade some people of your scientific point of view when you have scientific data to back you up, but some of them just are not interested and don't believe what you have to say? So I've realized over the past couple years that scientists may not be the best people to talk about climate change. What? Because we always think that one more equation or one more graph is going to convince people because that's what convinces us, because we've been trained to be convinced by that. But that's not how people work. 
um, you show people a graph, their brain shuts down and, and they don't care. Or they can't, they can't tell the difference between that graph and the other graph that they've just been shown. And so I think it's been a real learning experience for me to realize that facts are not what changes people's minds. Stories are what changes people's minds. Messengers are what changes people's minds. And all I can do is go in there and represent the facts to the best of my ability. And I think that is absolutely crucial because we need to be telling stories that are informed by the facts. But the facts aren't going to be enough to change people's minds. Maybe scientists have to learn how to become better storytellers? I would be totally on board with that. I, well, you've done that, I think, here tonight. So thank you for that. And you've also got the best name of anybody who's ever been on this program. <laughs> Dr. Kate Marvel from Columbia University and NASA. Great to have you here on TVO tonight. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> the Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.